I love the energy in the room right now and all of the great things that everybody's talking about, all the connections. Um, I know that our last group is making it their way through the uh, buffet, so give them, you know, give them space to sit with you, and we've got a great program planned for you next. So in our la last time I was up on this stage, we had a conversation about family offices. And um, somebody said, well, where do you find them? Well, I have a friend that I actually met during J.P. Morgan Week many years ago um, who runs an organization called the Ivy Family Office Network. And I had hoped that he would have been on that panel today, except that he's having the Ivy Family Office Network um, conference in San Francisco today. And so what we decided is we would collaborate. So um, right now, we are live streaming with the Ivy Family Office conference in San Francisco and with their family offices online. Um, there are over 400 family offices that are joining us now on the live stream. So um, with that, I would like to thank our lunch sponsor, um, J.P. Morgan. And in addition to generously providing financial support for the lunch, they did more than that. They got the financial expert who is going to lead our conversation next. So Mike Guido, would you please join me on stage? We good? All right. So, Mike, other than the fact that you're Joan's friend, who is Mike Guido? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here and, and allowing us to attend this spectacular event. It's first time for me. Um, I've heard a lot about it over the years, um, but it actually has blown my mind a little bit. I think that the, the sessions have been spectacular, the ones that I've been able to see. Um, so there is a lot of technological advancement taking place in this particular arena mm -hmm. in Arizona, and uh, I, we're really, really proud to be a part of it. So uh, my name is Mike Geetle. I lead our life sciences commercial banking practice at J.P. Morgan uh, across the Midwestern United States, the Inner Mountain region of the United States, and all of Canada. Uh, I sit in Minneapolis, so um, surprisingly, it's warmer in Minnesota today than it, than it is here. <laughs> Uh, and when you factor in the humidity, it feels even worse. So it's actually very nice to be here yesterday and today. Um, I have uh, 14 team members that, that are a part of, of the team covering this region. One of them is in the front row here, Linda Seca. Uh, and you know, I, I'm just blessed to have a, an incredibly strong team that helps early stage all the way through commercialized businesses do the things that they need to do from a, a, a blocking and tackling treasury management, credit cards, um, networking perspective, so that they can focus on building a business, right? We wanna take care of all the back office things that um, from a finance perspective that a company needs to, needs to do, whether it's helping you with your deposits, making sure you're getting a strong yield, um, all the way through advice to uh, you know, what's the expectation across the, the landscape in uh, the M&A space, the IPO space, we bring in our investment banking partners to make sure that you get to have those conversations early. Um, and, and I would say for the most part, our business is, is network advisory. We, we have a deep network of companies, of investors, of family offices, of organizations like in like a AZ bio uh, where we we can make really interesting uh, introductions to these types of, of companies so love to talk to all of you guys uh, I, every every one of you has a unique reason to exist um, and I want to make sure that that we can be there for you 
uh, as you continue to grow. So pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you. And you know, when we talk life science investing, the JP Morgan name is synonymous with investment, right? We all start our year every year at JP Morgan. And you know, when we look at this landscape, um, how do you make sense of the headlines? I mean, we've had, you know, a monumental rate cut, right, in the last week. We've seen, um, you know, political changes in countries, elections, you know, all of those things that are impacting. But, you know, biotech is such a specialized thing. What are some of the progress, the growth rates that are being projected for biotech right now? Yeah, I mean, there's new technology coming out all the time across biotech, across medical device, diagnostics. Um, and I think we're, you know, we, we can say that we're at the forefront all the time within this space because everything that's coming out of University of Arizona, Arizona State, all the other major research universities in this country and, and all over the world are taking older technologies and making them better or coming up with brand new technologies that are gonna make things more efficient. Um, let's talk about like GLP-1s. Everybody's familiar with what a GLP-1 is, being you know, owned by two companies, Novo Nordisk and, and Eli Lilly. Uh, that market had zero dollars of revenue three years ago. And it is projected to grow, depending on your source, uh, globally to almost $471 billion by 2034. Mm -hmm. So zero to almost $500 billion for one product in the course of 10 years is pretty unbelievable. It's incredibly remarkable. And it's going to, it's going to change the way we think about chronic disease and metabolic diseases um, forever. I think it's always going to be a part of it. Uh, as long as as long as people can tolerate the adverse effects of of those drugs, um, it is incredibly efficacious. Mm -hmm. And and so, but GLP ones have been around for a long time. They just haven't. Those adverse effects were causing them to you know really be a graveyard across across the biotech space until they were able to figure out a, a particular formula that actually worked. And the formula that worked happens to be you know the Ozempics and your Zep bounds and, and, and well, the others. And we've seen the same thing with um, mRNA technologies. You know, yeah. up until COVID, you couldn't get somebody to fund an mRNA technology for hunger, right? Everybody's like, oh, that doesn't work. Exactly. After COVID, all of a sudden, mRNA is hot. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could say mRNA with COVID is the same thing that, that telehealth was with COVID, like before, before COVID, telehealth was, yeah, it's a nice to have, no reimbursement, like people would rather go see their doctor than talk to them over, over a video screen. Well, then Zoom came out and COVID happened and all of a sudden you accelerate what could have taken 15 years to get to the adoption phase, now it happened overnight. I think the same thing happened with mRNA vaccines um, and the efficacy that, that it was, that it had showcased there too. So yeah, mRNA is, is, is really, again, early, early innings mm -hmm. when it comes to what we, what we see uh, across the mRNA landscape. All right, so new technologies, early, early in it, AI. AI. Um, AI and drug discovery mm -hmm. is, is really, I mean, that, that is super early innings. Uh, we haven't had a drug that has come to, that has become commercialized yet. Uh, there are a number that are in the clinic. Um, there is a new company. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Zera Therapeutics. Um, raised a billion dollar with a B uh, seed round, uh, and and they're in they're in San Francisco. But uh, they are they are putting money and power behind what AI drug discovery is going to look like in in the next couple of decades. Right? They're making a bet that this is, this is going to change what biotech discovery is and hopefully shave 10 years off of the discovery process by, by utilizing um, 
you know, new types of, of AI chemistry. Yeah. But, you know, um, I know Chris Yu is in the audience. He was involved with a company that um, Systems Imagination, and one of their founders used to say that the number of possible combinations are more than the stars in the universe. And the human mind just can't get their, their hands around that without help. Yeah. I mean, I think th this step is going to be wrong, I think. But like, we've, only, we've only looked at like 15% of, maybe less, of diseases that are actually out there and have looked for cures or, or other things related to those diseases. But there's still 85% of other diseases, and you have all these orphan diseases that are out there that, you know, until, there, until there's money in it, you know, no one's going to focus on. Until the addressable market gets large enough, people aren't gonna focus on it. And that, we need to figure out ways to make sure that all, all diseases are being looked at and focused on. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the equity that, it, it, that we're it, looking for. It, it, and it's gonna be a challenge. I mean, when we talk about precision medicine, and you talked about orphan diseases, right? We had exploded the number of orphan diseases because the more we learn about each person's genetic profile, each person's epigenetic profile, and the omics continue, um, these diseases just keep getting subsetted and subsetted. Right. So, if we're gonna to continue to develop for a disease by disease platform, okay, pretty soon, we're not gonna be able to afford to do that anymore. So AI allows us to possibly look at those syndications where we can make the work in one and then do the label expansions to help the many using that power. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. So m and um, for the investors in the room, yes, we love the science and we love the people and we want to change the world, but we don't make money unless there's an exit. What's going on in the M&A space? Um, the M&A space is, is it's heating up. Uh, on the biotech side, there have been uh, 38 M&As so far this, sorry, 48 M&As so far this year. Um, for a total of $40 billion, sorry, $34 billion. Yeah, 48, 48 deals for $34 billion. What, so M&A is really, really important for both the biotech side and the medical device side. Um, probably more on the medical device side because that seems to be the pathway that, that companies mm -hmm. end up getting liquidity for their investors. Um, you know, the biotech side, there are always going to be gaps, right? There's always going to be gaps that, that, that they need to fill within, within their pipelines. Um, over the course of the next 10 years, Big Pharma is going to lose $200 billion of uh, loss of, ex, you know, they're going to lose exclusivity on their, on their drugs, right? And so uh, they're constantly looking for earlier stage biotechs, mm -hmm. and a lot of cases, biotechs that have de-risked already into the clinic um, so that they can start to, again, where they have gaps in, in what they want to sell and who they want to sell against, uh, they want to be first to market in order to create that next big blockbuster like Humira or, or, or something else. Um, it's the same thing on the medical device side. Mm -hmm. uh, medical device has a, a larger number, 114 M&As just through the beginning of this year. Um, for $40 billion, um, and three of them cover almost half of it. So one was J&J's acquisition of Shockwave for $13 billion, um, and then Boston Scientific has been, uh, has been strong in the acquisition space too. Um, they bought Exonix for $3 billion. At the beginning of the year, that was announced at, at the J.P. Morgan conference, um, and, and they, bought, they bought another one as well uh, at the Silk Road, Silk Road Medical. But like the exit market for medical device is is usually M and A. Like there, there were like in 2021 there were a number of of medtech IPOs mm -hmm. um, even before that. But most of them do a dual track, and they'll they'll either dual track means you're either going to go out and look for 
look to sell as an M&A or do an IPO. Um, and our investment bankers will determine what that looks like and, and how to do it. Um, but on the medical device side, you have to have revenue. You have to showcase adoption. You have to have reimbursement, right? And on the biotech side, you need to get through your phase three clinical and, and you know, get your NDA, right? And so the, the ability to have a blockbuster drug without any revenue before it is, is much higher if you get that FDA approval and the addressable market is large versus a medical device company where they're typically invasive, right? A drug's not invasive, but, right. but, a, but a device typically is. Uh, and and those, those devices need to showcase adoption in the marketplace that patients are actually going to utilize it, mm -hmm. that insurance is gonna pay for it, that CMS is gonna pay for it, and the, you know, the commercial payers are gonna pay for it. So seeing that adoption first, it, it gives a lot of comfort to the strategics. So shifting now from the strategics to the public markets, um, especially, you know, we, we saw this wave of early IPOs before COVID. And then we saw some odd IPOs during COVID. Um, and then we saw no IPOs. What's going on in the IPO space? Um, in 2021, there were 600 SPACs. So SPAC is a um, special purpose acquisition via, uh, corporation. Uh, half of them basically liquidated. So they gave, they gave the money back to the investors who had originally seeded it. Um, and that was, that was a phenomenon. That was a crazy, crazy phenomenon in 2021. 600, I think there have been 30 SPACs so far this year. Um, and that's not in biotech, that's just across, mm -hmm. across the space. Uh, there have been 52 total IPOs this year. That is more than the 31 that was done all of last year. So we're in a good spot in terms of, of and, and those IPOs range from healthcare to technology to real estate finance, consumer, 25% um, of those IPOs are, are in the healthcare space, 25 are in tech, another 25-ish are in real estate. Um, but they've, they've also raised about 68% more than they've raised in 2023. Mm -hmm. So like, there are windows, there are windows that are open out there for the right companies. Obviously AI has been AI and technology itself has, has been funded incredibly well, and, and those IPOs have, have gone off really well. In the biotech side, there have been 14 biotech IPOs as of last Friday. Uh, for a grand total of $3 billion raised in the market, which is better than the $2.6 billion that was raised all of last year. Okay. So 14, there were 11 total IPOs in the biotech space last year, 14 already just through yesterday through last Friday, um, having rates come down by 50 basis points yesterday, I, I have not looked at the stock market, but it was up it like, was it, the NASDAQ up. <laughs> was up almost 3% um, last time I looked. Like that is going to start, and, and maybe this is a question for the family office folks, but like the money that, that investors have today, if you can get a risk-free rate of 5% in a, in a savings account, why, why would you take it out and, and spend it on something that's incredibly risky for the opportunity to maybe get a you know, 22X return in 10 years, mm -hmm. right? So now that rates are starting to come down, investors need to put their money somewhere, right? They can't just keep it in the bank anymore. They can't keep it in money market funds. I think we're gonna start to see some loosening of, of I don't wanna say purse strings, um, but there's gonna be more more reason for investors to get back into the market. And I think the, the uncertainty that we've seen globally um, it has really impacted families, right? Families have looked at this and said, you know, I'm just gonna wait. Um, but I, I am seeing a lot of signs that it's gonna be a real interesting first quarter next year. Yeah, and I, again, like I think it's gonna be an interesting first quarter next year yeah. because again, like we, we look at like three macro, we look at three things on the macro side. The first is um, 
you know, what's, what's happening with monetary policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we saw what happened yesterday with monetary policy is starting to loosen, which is good. Uh, we look at inflation, mm -hmm. uh, and inflation has come down from record highs down to 2.5% as of last month. Um, and then we look at geo geopolitics, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's it, here in the United States with uh, uh, an election coming up in November, or wars in, in the Middle East, wars in Ukraine, um, you know, dictatorships in other areas that are, um, that just create uncertainty in the market and create uncertainty in, for investors and investors hate uncertainty. Like we like certainty. We, we, we like to know that when we put our money into something that things are going to go the right way. Uh, and so I think that's really the only yellowish flag, I mm -hmm. think, for, for us right now. Um, but, but we have the monetary policy down. I think it's going to, I mean, they even, they even said the next, the next one in November is probably going to be a 50 basis point rate cut as well. Um, so I think we're, we're working our way towards a loosening of the economy, which is going to put more money into, into the markets. And it's always interesting how the timing falls around elections with those kind of changes. Um, so, unicorns. Um, you know, everybody wants a unicorn. <laughs> unicorns are rare, or they're supposed to be. Um, and many unicorns don't hold their value as unicorns after their IPO. Yeah. So, the unicorn landscape. Is there a herd of new unicorns out there somewhere? Not in biotech. No. Um, I think the average, the average size of like the pre-money valuation on a biotech is, has been right around like four or five hundred million. Um, and 50 percent of the, those 14 companies that went public this year in the biotech side are trading below their their original issue price, uh, which is not great. The 2022 vintage is trading at an 80%. Like 80% 80 of those companies that went public are trading below their IPO price. 2021, 72%, right? 2023, I think is like 64%. But it is, it's not a great, like the, the aftermarket effect of, of some of these IPOs have not been very good. But I can tell you, the follow-on side has been absolutely robust. And so from a follow-on perspective, that means the company is already public. The company has really great data that they just came out with. They got a, a positive read on a phase two data readout, uh, and their stock pops by 20%. They will raise on the back of that all day long to fund their next phase, right? Um, so there's been $20 billion of that that has taken place just in the first half of, of this year, uh, of which uh, there have been 76 of those. And, and the numbers that I'm, that I'm quoting are for those deals that are over $50 million in, in total value. Okay. Um, so I, there are a lot more than those 76 that did follow-ons, but they, were, you know, they might raise a million dollars or $2 million, which is a lot of money and it's important. Um, but for, for our sake and for our conversation, yeah. that's, that's what we're talking about. Well, and you know, the, I think it is important, just, to, just a quick side note on that, as far as when do you IPO? And I've seen so many companies do the little IPO, right? The million dollar, five million dollar, $10 million IPO, um, for whatever reason, and, and every company is unique. Um, but once you have done that, you live in a different world. You live by different rules. You talk to different investors. Everything changes. And if you IPO too early, the odds of success are not good. That, I mean, that is absolutely spot on. Um, a lot of folks will, will go the IPO route when they can't get funding from institutional investors or other family offices. Um, but when you're a penny stock, it is so hard to raise, to raise money. Um, and so like absolutely, 
the advice would be to de-risk as much as you possibly can. Make sure that you have a strong C-suite with you. Make sure that you have at least some backers that will, will cross over into your IPO. Um, and make sure that your technology is differentiated, right? And if, like, you can't be a me too and go public. It's just really, really hard to do. Um, you, can, like, you can go public in the GLP-1 space if you're focused on like a different mechanism of action of the GLP-1, right? So there are lots yeah. of areas to, to do that mm -hmm. because it's not, right now it's a two, two company game, but you know, they're, they're making bets all over the place. Yeah. And some of those companies are public. One is Turn that just did a follow on after having good data. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, it's really, really important to have differentiated product um, and an and, and actual like unmet need. Like what is the unmet need? Don't create a product and, and try to find a need for that product that you created because you thought it was really cool. Find the unmet need that's actually out there in the marketplace and create a product that's going to fit that need. And, and I, I, there are a lot of organizations out there that will do that kind of the me too thing, like, hey, I created this really cool thing in, in the lab and there's gotta be something out there for it, right? And, and that's just, you should always think about it the opposite yeah. way. So, I mean, staging companies in general, Right, trying to get them ready. I know, like, when I talk to my friends that are VCs, right, the ABCs are, you know, A, you put together a great team, B, you started to build a big, a great business, C, you better be in the clinic, right? And, you know, if you look at the ABCs that way, how do those ABCs of, I'm in the clinic, I'm preclinical, when you start to look at public markets? So, um, again, 14 biotech IPOs so far this year. How many do you think uh, were preclinical? Of the 14? Of the 14. Six? One. One company was preclinical, and that company um, is not doing very well. Um, there is a, a flight to de-risking across the biotech space. And uh, I, I, I think it's been, I think there was only one last year as well. Um, but you haven't seen like the preclinicals going public. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to almost 2021 to see that, right? And 2021 was obviously a year of- uh, Crazy. I like to call it irrational exuberance. <laughs> um, but that, that is what it was. 2021 is, was the year of a hope and a prayer. And, and we needed hopes and prayers in 2021. Yeah, but 2021 was a year where, where like all of the money that had come in to stimulate the economy just went into stuff that hadn't been de-risked. You know, people were like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm gonna give you a couple million bucks. And it just, and now that the supply of money has been reined in and like savings accounts have been depleted for the most part, mm -hmm. um, like there's no, now, now people are actually making rational decisions. And when I say people, not, not only just like individual investors, but institutional investors and venture capitalists mm -hmm. uh, are, are making decisions that aren't like, it's hope and a prayer, but they're doing diligence. They're sitting in, they're sitting in diligence. You guys are probably seeing this, but like VCs are sitting in diligence sometimes for six months on your, on your business. And they keep coming back and asking you questions. And like, they want to be very, very certain that you have dotted your I's, crossed your T's, that your, you know, that your clinical trial design is the right clinical trial design in order to get the indication that you need, that you have the right patients in your clinical trial. Um, you know, so it's, it's all of those types of things that are really, really important that a lot of these venture capitalists are looking for. So, I mean, there was almost an obscene amount of money that went into venture capital over the COVID era. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very interesting to me when I was at JP Morgan last year and we were talking about this and you know, one of the investors said, a lot of that money got given back, right? We didn't, you know, it was on a, it was on a clock and we couldn't invest it fast enough. Yeah. Um, you work with institutionals. 
J.P. Morgan on one side is an institutional. Right. Um, help them uh, help us understand what does that institutional clock look like on the investor side when you're talking about these big funds. How much time do they have to deploy? So as, as Dan had said in in the prior in the prior panel, uh, it's, it's usually a ten year fund, um, and like you need those 10 years if you're a biotech, you know, if you're a biotech fund. A lot of these, a lot of the biotechs, some of them will, you know, they'll, not biotechs, uh, venture capitalists, they'll build their own businesses, right? They'll, they'll take a molecule or an asset out of MIT or Harvard or somewhere else and they will build a team around it. They will, you know, they recognize that it's a very unique mechanism of action and they will seed it with a billion dollars in some cases, um, but usually they'll seed it with you know ten to fifteen, and and then they will just start to incubate it and, and build it right. Uh, it's like the flagship pioneering model, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then others will say, hey, seed funds will always say, hey, we've got a half a half a million dollars that we're willing to throw around. We're going to throw it around in two hundred different companies, uh, and we're going to hope that ten of them, you know, return the fund or, or more, right? And mm -hmm. But like your Series A and Series B funds, like you really need to start de-risking. Your preclinical data needs to be great. Your phase one data needs to showcase safety, but have some other endpoints around efficacy mm -hmm. that are, are going to give you that step up in valuation. Um, and so like that's, that's what they're looking for. Again, there are, there were, there were, 400 companies last December that were 400 biotech companies last December that were trading at cash or below 400 meaning that like investors said we don't think that you're worth the amount of cash that you're burning we don't we don't we don't believe that your data is going to come in the way it's supposed to or whatever it is or we don't think you have enough runway to even get to the data that you have and we're not willing to support it because we don't, we don't know. It's a flip of a card. It's black and white. Mm -hmm. As of today, there are only 100 that are trading at cash or below, which means that 75% of them got to some type of catalyst point mm -hmm. and were able to raise off the, off the backs of that. Um, some of the research that we've done showcases uh, that, like I think the number in December that had less than a year's worth of cash were very significant. That, that has come down significantly. They raised on these follow-on. Now a vast majority of these 300 biotechs that we raised have about, about three years of runway left, okay. which is really important. And, but again, any glitch in your science, three years is not a very long runway. Not at all, because you're gonna pivot, right. usually. Yeah, or the board shuts you down. Or the board will shut you down. They don't want to put more money in. No. So um, I wish I could say that I had lots of companies getting ready for IPOs right now in Arizona. We have a handful. Um, some are in this room. But a little closer to home, okay? When I'm seeking, and when I'm a, an early stage or, or mid stage biotech, uh, med tech company, and I'm seeking investment. What are those pinch points in accessing capital, you know, when we're looking at dilutive funding? Yeah. Um, what, do, what do I have to focus on? Yeah, I mean, for, for the startups in the room, and Dan, Dan also, a lot of the things that Dan said, I'm, I'm going to take from him because they're, they're spot on. Um, but like, Venture capitalists, they look at personality first. They look at, am I going to be able to get along with you? If I'm gonna sit on your board and I'm gonna work with you for the next five years, it better not be like this, right? Like we, we need to be able to get along. I need to be able to critique you and the things that you're doing because I know what I'm talking about and I know you think you know what you're talking about and you probably do, but like you can't just like be abrasive and, and all those things. So like the first, Thing that venture capital folks look at is can I build a relationship with you, right? What is your personality like? What's the EQ? Um, 
And once they get past that, then it's, what's the rest of your team look like? How, how have you built it out? Who are your, who are your KOLs that you, you put on your scientific advisory board? Um, how are you designing your, your clinical trial or your pivotal trial or your pilot trial if it's a device company? Um, how, are you, how, are you, how are you differentiating your particular product from what else is out there, right? In, in the medical device world, we have what's called a 510K pathway. And that 510K pathway uses a predicate device. And some people think the, you know, they can change a predicate device by changing the handle on, you know, on, on some catheter that's going, you know, that's gonna go into the body and think that they're gonna get the reimbursement and they're gonna get funded and all that. It's just, that, that's not gonna happen. No. It's not gonna happen at all. So like, when you think about your different pathways, you have to know that there's a gap somewhere and that you're gonna fill that gap with a much better technology that is gonna end up being standard of care. So are you gonna be the next standard of care or are you gonna be a me too? Do you have the right team around you from a C-suite standpoint? Do you have the personality to go out and actually raise funds from in investors who are both scientific and generalists? Uh, and you know, if you bring all that stuff together, I think you, you have a winning combination for, uh, for raising money. And if you don't have the winning combination for raising money, um, don't mortgage your house. That's a great. <laughs> or find, like, if you don't have those three ingredients, but you have the technology and the technology's there, but you're the founder of the company and you're not, maybe you're not as personable as somebody else, find somebody else to go out there and be the CEO and, and you know, go out there and raise money on behalf of this business because it, it's gonna change, it, it will, it'll be life-changing for the company. Well, and so to wrap it up, we, we've been talking about a lot of stuff, right? We've looked at the landscape as it's changing. We've looked at you know, the IPOs, the big exits, you know, at any exit sometimes is a godsend to an investor who's been waiting a long time. Um, if there were like any pearls of wisdom that you wanted to use in your closing thought, what's, what are the one or two things that you really hope they take away today? Don't give up, right? Like it, it is a slog. And I, I, am, I am not a, an entrepreneur uh, and just because, and, but like don't give up. Like, you're gonna get a thousand no's before you get to a yes. And like you have to, you have to have perseverance and you have to have grit to, to push through the no's. When you get a no, ask why. Like what's, what's the reasoning? Why, why, why are you not interested in my business? Is it the business plan? Is it, is it me? Is it whatever? But get feedback. After every no you get, get feedback. Incorporate it back into your pitch deck and start over again, right? I think, I don't know, each, each company, a lot of the companies that we talk to and we see their pitch deck, they're on iteration number 155, right? And like, and because, you know, if they send it to us, they'll, you'll see like XYZ Medical or XYZ Biotech, F, you know, final 155. And it's like, okay, these guys have been at this for a while and, but they're learning and, you know, we wanna help you as you continue to do that. So um, don't give up. That's what that, that those are. That's the nugget that I would say. Thank you, and um, I would add to that: don't give up with the next great life science health innovation, because patients are waiting for us. One hundred percent to get it done. Uh, Mike, thank you. You bet. Thanks for having me.